Okay, so um, rationality is perhaps the most foundational uh, idea in economics. And um, today I want to think a little bit about what it means. And uh, is, is Yike, Yike Wayne here? Yike Wayne? No. Does anyone else want to try to give a definition of rationality? <laughs> so that I can ridicule you and tell you how wrong you are? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. How about the people respond to incentives? Okay, the people respond to incentives. That's one de definition. Let me try to give a bit broader of a definition in the spirit of what we just said. So that people act so as to achieve their ends as well as possible using the means available to them. And what Gary basically talked to, or what we've been learning in class so far, is that implies that people respond to incentives, right? But, and it, in some ways, it's almost equivalent to that, right? Yeah. So, um, I think that this is a bad definition of rationality, and I hope this lecture will persuade you that it's a bad definition of rationality, um, because of the word well, or incentive, in the way you phrase it. So, what is well, and what is your incentive uh, is not always obvious, uh, or it's certainly not always self-evident. So, what, the way I instead want to define rationality is that someone acting in a manner which you can respect. That is, the person has carefully reflected upon their action, has goals that seem reasonable or at least worth listening to, uh, that you could have a useful conversation with the person that they wouldn't really just be like, talking to sort of a, a man. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean you need to agree with everything that the person does or thinks or says, but that they are not clearly confused or mistaken, and if they are clearly confused or mistaken, that they don't persist in being so. So, um, the goal of the class, I bet some of you started laughing, Andre certainly did when I first gave him the second definition of rationality, that it seems sort of flippant or silly or something like that. But I hope during the course of the class you'll realize that actually the standard economic definition of rationality is absurd, and that uh, only something like this could possibly be a reasonable notion of rationality. So I, I actually think it won't be that hard to persuade you of that, but we'll see. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about why the sort of classical people respond to incentives or act to achieve their goals well, notion is actually meaningless. Uh, and that we need to always think beyond internal consistency or responding to incentives to be saying anything. And I'll then talk about uh, rational attitudes towards uncertainty, as well as empirical data on what uh, are actually people's attitudes towards risk. Okay. So, rationality in economics basically serves two purposes. One is in normative and one is in positive economics. In normative economics, uh, rationality, us demanding rationality of ourselves, us demanding rationality of each other when we have conversations, um, helps us think about how we should be acting and what we should think are reasonable arguments for economic policies, for empirical identification strategies, etc. So the normative role of decision theory that we'll learn today is that, is that it's useful to us as we reflect on the debates we're having as academics. So it helps us resist confused or poor reasoning, and it helps us analyze arguments and think through problems, like the problem that you have to do this week. Um, so it also is really the foundation of econometrics. Most of the stuff that you learn in econometrics is founded in statistics, which is in turn found in the decision theory. Um, it also helps us when we write down, say, the planning problem of a social planner. We want that social planner to obey the rules of decision theory if we think that's a normatively compelling way to you know, think to optimize. So decision theory is useful on the normative end in helping us evaluate arguments and formulate uh, decision problems. Yeah. What do you mean by useful? Is it sort of like circular things saying like normative is what is useful and it's useful because it's normative? No, I don't think so because when, when I say normative, it's, it's, you know, we have to figure out what it is that we think 
we should be maximizing. In that process, it's useful to have certain rules that point out to us potential inconsistencies in the views that we have. And we'll go through some of those, uh, or not inconsistencies, because I'm actually going to argue that's not a reasonable way to think about rationality, but certain criteria for what constitutes a compelling or not a compelling argument. And of course, you know, is it tautological? In some sense, yes, but so is mathematics. And we think mathematics is useful to us, right? Mathematics is a set of formal rules for reasoning, and that's all decision theory is, right? So positive decision theory, on the other hand, uh, studies how people actually do behave and think. That is, it's a set of rules for interpreting behavior that we actually observe, rather than trying to decide what, how we want to behave. And sort of the mo one of the most fundamental postulates of economics is that people behave rationally. In fact, Gary would argue that this defines what economics is. And I'm going to point out a little bit that I'm not sure behavioral economics is any different than this, actually. Uh, so during most of the course, we're going to interpret or predict behavior on the basis of an assumption that that behavior is rational in some sense. And this is quite a powerful approach. It's actually very similar in spirit to evolution. So what is evolution? It's basically the idea that we interpret the traits that we observe in different uh, species as adaptive to some environment in which we uh, view them as living. And really, economics is just the same idea. It's that behavior is optimal given the constraints and information in that space. Yeah? Well, one of the things that in evolution, at least what, what you have up there is that the environment changes a lot faster than the traits can necessarily. So what we, some of the traits you might see were optimal for a previous environment. So I mean, could you get the same problem in economics where you're your well, behavior is op was optimal for the last What you're describing, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever done any evolutionary biology, but that's just not the way that it works. I mean, that, everyone acknowledges that that's true. But the way that 99% of what goes on in evolutionary biology is people saying, here's some trait of this animal. What was the trait of the environment that was adapted to it? And it's absolutely the case that the people could be causing, that the animals could be causing the environment to change more quickly than they're able to adapt to it. But that's just not the most, I mean, so in other words, there's nothing logically required by the standard evolutionary paradigm, even if you believe in the possibility of selection. Nonetheless, that's the paradigm that they use. Similarly, there's, abs there's nothing absolutely required about rationality, because there could always be bounds on that rationality that could overwhelm it, and so forth. But nonetheless, economists typically choose to interpret things in this way. And, that, and so there's a very close analogy between what goes on in evolution and what goes on. And in fact, your point is it might be even less plausible in evolution than it is in economics. Right? So. I mean, what's the analogy for animals going extinct, which we know happens to the economic yeah. Right? Animal traits are adapted to the environment, but the species go extinct and become extinct all the time. Right? So we... uh, well, people turn out to have made mistakes all the time, right? If the environment changes, right? If there's, that, that's basically uncertainty. I mean, uncertainty in biology is the same as uncertainty in economics, right? Okay, um, so the classical notions of rationality are based on consistency, and I think that you know most of you will be pretty well acquainted uh, with these, but let's just go back through them uh, for a refresher. So um, I'm going to use strict preferences here. Uh, what does it mean for a strict preference denoted by x is strictly preferred to y to be consistent, Fogun uh, Zhang? Fogun Zhang? Does anyone else want to say what it means for a preference ordering to be consistent or rational? Okay. Complete, complete and transitive. Uh, not for a strict preference ordering. For a strict preference ordering, it's that it's asymmetric. If I prefer x over y, then I don't strictly prefer y over x. And, in tr and transitive, if I prefer x to y and y to z, then I prefer x to z. Okay. And the idea is basically that this represents your, reflect your preferences upon reflection. So if someone points out to you that you, you know, are doing something that implicitly requires you to prefer x to y, y to z, and then z to x, then you would say, oh crap, you'd think about it, and then you'd eventually come 
to some preference that was consistent, because you would never view it as being reasonable to have a preference that was uh, transitive in this way. Um, the, the second, so we can also phrase rationality equivalently in terms of choice behavior. So uh, we're going to say that x is chosen from a, which is x is an element of the choices of a, means that if you are presented with a set of options a, you would be happy to choose the option x. Maybe you'd also be happy to choose other things, but you would certainly be happy to choose the option x. Um, so, uh, so uh, Connor, Devin, what uh, is the requirement of rationality for choice behavior? So, so what we, we just said that rationality of preferences is the x is preferred to y is symmetry and transitivity. What's the basic requirement for um, choice behavior? Imagine that Z 